So this, my friends, is the Tough Dash F15, an ultra portable gaming laptop that looks almost too good to be true. You see, it's thin, it's lightweight, and has amazing battery life. And best of all, it rocks an RTX 3070, and it costs just a little over $1,400 US. Now, sure, it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but comparing this to the average laptops featuring 2070 Super, it's hundreds of dollars less unless you find one on a really good deal. Now, the RTX 3070 should give you more performance than a 2070 Super, technically, but more on that a little bit later on in the video. You see, what are you actually sacrificing uh, for this kind of graphics performance? There's a lot I want to get to in this video, uh, like why this might be a case of a buyer beware situation, especially with these new NVIDIA GPUs, and how CP performance on a laptop like the Dash might factor into that. So let's jump right into this, but first, a quick message from our sponsor. The new Corsair K100 RGB is a true flagship keyboard with 4000 Hz polling rate and new OPX optical mechanical switches, quality PBT keycaps, a gorgeous redesign all around, and a new IQ wheel that has a lot of functionality. Check out the K100 RGB down below. All right, so I wanna start things off with the spec sheet. Starting off with the RTX 3080, 3070, and 3060, because they're a bit of a switch up from the last generation. While the RTX 2000 Super GPUs had the exact same specs as both desktops and mobile, these are like really, really different. So both the RTX 3080 and 3070 get a pretty big cut in the number of CUDA cores this time, and they're based off the same GA104 core as the desktop RTX 3070 and 3060 Ti. The RTX 3080 also gets its memory interface slashed to 256-bit, but there's now a 16 gigabyte version of that card. The 3060, on the other hand, well, that's where it gets a core increase since it's using a fully enabled version of the GA106 core from the new desktop variant. So what's really happening here? Well, some of you might be thinking that it's a conspiracy to give low performance or something crazy like that. But after talking to Mike, I think we've come up with another theory. You see, by using cores with different number of portions disabled, NVIDIA is actually able to launch these without having to sacrifice desktop GPUs. So they can maximize yields on the GA104 core, which is easier to produce than the GA102 that goes into the desktop RTX 3080 and the RTX 3090. Now, about that buyer beware situation that I talked about earlier, I mean, it's been around for a long time with laptops, but I think it's about to get a lot more confusing. You see, it all comes down to the amount of power that the GPU can consume. Desktop GPUs all have a pretty constant power draw. So for example, if you buy two RTX 3080s, they'll probably eat around you know 320 watts, provided that they're not overclocked. On the laptop side, it's actually a lot more fluid since power is specified based on the thermal and power limitations of each laptop design. So more power means more performance, but that also means higher heat loads. So you can bet that the laptop that's rocking a 125 watt RTX 3070 will run circles around the same GPU, but that only consumes 80 watts and it'll run hotter as well. But just determining what sort of GPU you're gonna get is not easy since manufacturers actually don't advertise what power settings their hardware is running at. NVIDIA's Max-Q spec used to give at least some idea, but that's been modified, so it won't be able to indicate uh, a lower power model anymore, which is just really, really unfortunate. Instead, Max-Q is sort of a catch-all phrase now for a bunch of technologies. That includes Dynamic Boost 2.0 that balances CPU and GPU power depending on load conditions, a new whisper mode for better acoustics, and DLSS along with NVIDIA's new resizable bar feature. So you can see that by adding certain features, Max-Q just no longer has the same meaning and it won't be used to highlight power anymore. The problem with the laptop market is the same with the pre-built PC space. You see, when you pair up a fast GPU with a slow CPU, that could leave a massive amount of performance on the table, especially at low resolutions like 1080p. And that's where the Dash 15 CPU needs to be brought up because this guy's using Intel's Tiger Lake Core i7 11370H. 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 Intel. You can actually check out our overview right over here, uh, but it's actually an exciting design based off Intel's latest architecture. But this CPU uh, is also based off a design meant for the Ultrabook market because it only has four PCI Gen 4 lanes. So you see where this is all going, right? Synergy between CPU and GPU is super critical, especially when it comes to laptops. So I guess that leads me into what kind of gaming performance you can get from the RTX 3070 inside a slim and portable 
uh, dash F15. But before that, I need to put these results into context. You see, the F15 has three different performance preset settings uh, that you can get through through their Armory Grade software. Uh, it's called Silent, Performance, and Turbo. Across every mode, temperatures are kept really well in check, uh, and the maximum is just 76 degrees Celsius. One thing I do need to mention is that in Turbo mode, ASUS relaxes thermal constraints and their effect on clock speeds. So Turbo mode is about 100 megahertz faster on average than setting the dash to performance. And silent mode, well, it never went above 990 megahertz, so you'll sacrifice some major frame rates there. Now, based on the amount of power being sent to the GPU package, it looks like ASUS is pushing the RTX 3070 to just 80 watts or even a bit less. That puts it pretty much where the older Max-Q cards bottomed out, which means this is probably going to be one of the lowest performing RTX 3070s we'll see. Just take that into account when looking at the benchmarks. Noise isn't that bad either with all the modes staying under the 50 decibel mark, uh, and it's pretty obvious that ASUS is sacrificing some top-end performance in order to reduce that. The interesting thing here is that there's very little separating the performance and the turbo presets. Another critical area for thin and light laptops is surface temperatures, and those are kept under control really well. The only thing I'm not too crazy about is the hot air that's exhausting from the side because it blasts right onto uh, your hand when you're using your external mouse, so that can get a little uncomfortable. Now let's get right into benchmarks, so starting off with Call of Duty. And right away, you can see that the Dash 15 gives pretty reasonable average frame rates but COD loves more processing threats, so I'm thinking those 1% lows point towards a CPU bottleneck. Overall, though, the performance is good, but a lot lower than we'd expect uh, from an RTX 3070. CSGO, on the other hand, loves single-thread environments, and here the Dash 15 is actually able to beat and outperform the MSI GS66 by a slim margin, even though its GPU is set to a lower power envelope. Remember, that this laptop went for over $2,400 last year. Then again, 1% lows take a hit again and hover around what those previous generation AMD laptops hit. Doom ends up really highlighting how inconsistent the Dash 15's performance is, since this time it bridges the gap between the similarly priced AMD designs, but it still trails behind the RTX 2080 and 2070 Max-Q designs. The same goes for Jedi Order, which tends to favor multi-core rendering a bit more than some other titles, but I think a trend's becoming clear. Even at just 80 watts, an RTX 3070 should be performing better than this. Rainbow Six is an interesting one too. While the average frame rates make the Dash 15 a pretty good value, it really struggles to deliver consistent FPS, and that shows in the really poor 99 percentile results. Now, based on its name alone, the RTX 3070 is supposed to be much faster than the RTX 2070 and 2080 Super, right? Well, not with the Dash 15, because it's mostly due to the GPU operating at a lower power envelope than the other Super Max-Q GPUs in our charts. Those average between 89 watts and 95 watts, while this one just topped out at just 80 watts. The other issue can be traced back to, you guessed it, a bottleneck. You can actually see this by checking out GPU usage. On a laptop like the MSI GA66 and almost every other one we've tested, GPU utilization tends to be between 96 and 99%. And that means the CPU is able to process information as quickly as the graphics card is able to supply it. With the F15 in performance mode, well, that number gets cut to an average of 92% and a lot of inconsistency. You see, those GPU cycles are being left idle, waiting for the CPU to catch up in some games, and that causes huge frame time dips. But does Turbo Mode do anything? Well, the answer to that is no, and <laughs> utilization ended up being exactly the same. I think the problem here is pretty simple, guys. Even at just 80 watts, the RTX 3070 is overpowered for the Tiger Lake H35 platform. I just can't point fingers towards one single factor either. It could be a PCIe limitation or a CPU or both, but either way, it's there. Now, the sample that we have over here goes all out in terms of specs. Some of the highest end spec isn't the right call for a lot of people. With that in mind, the Dash 15 also comes with an RTX 3060 and a 512 gig SSD for a whole lot less money. And if you thought those gaming benchmarks were interesting, let's actually move on to how well the Dash 15 uh, handles the i7 11370H. Anyways, power input on the Tiger Lake i7 is really, really high. At first, I thought HW Info was misreporting, but it turns out that isn't the case. According to Intel, this chip can hit upwards of 60 watts for shorter periods of time, but after that, it should technically fall back to around 35 watts under a full core load. 
That doesn't happen here with turbo mode sticking to a constant 60 watts, while even performance mode nails at a constant 48 watts. Basically, this follows with what we've seen from Intel, where they have their CPUs specified at lower power, but partners can push them a lot higher without any problems. It also makes me wonder why Asus didn't use a Comet Lake H series processor, because this thing is sucking down almost the same amount of power as some of the 10750Hs we've seen before. In the top two modes, that leads to some aggressive clock speeds at or above above 4 GHz, while silence sticks very close to Intel's base frequency. It just feels like Asus is pushing this little chip for all it's worth. Considering the maximum junction temperature of this CPU is 100 degrees, the Dash 15 manages to control heat pretty well. It never throttled or even got closer to it. Performance mode started getting up there, but the fans kicked into higher speed to take that under control. Anyways, one of the biggest surprises is how good Tiger Lake is with single and lightly thread performance tasks. And this is probably what's preventing it from getting absolutely spanked in gaming benchmarks. Then again, operating at a constant 48 watts doesn't do all that much to stop the 11370H from getting slapped around pretty hard by the AMD CPUs in purely multi-core loads. But as we go through the other benchmarks, you'll notice that this processor behaves a lot like an i7 9750H from a few years ago. It's within 10 to 20% of the MSI GS66. And remember, that laptop was going for almost double the price of this one over here. Even in Premiere, it's getting respectable results, probably because the app's able to leverage the quick sync video engine to accelerate renders. Meanwhile, DaVinci Resolve could have been a lot worse, but since it renders are pretty GPU focused, the RTX 3070 helps prop up the result in a pretty big way. Now where this thing really shines is in battery life. Even in performance mode, we got a crazy 15 hours and 45 minutes out of it, which is a new record for a gaming laptop. Even under a heavier workload, there's more than three hours of time before the battery dies. Now, since our heavy workload is a combination of lightly and heavily multi-thread workloads, the super high power consumption we saw just a few minutes ago doesn't impact the results, but it could in the right circumstances, so take that into account. So with all of that out of the way, let's talk about the design and build quality of the Dash F15. Now, I like what Asus has done designing this thing. It's pretty subtle with a few tough typography accents, and I really like it. There are two color options. Uh, the one I have over here is called Eclipse Gray, but there's another one called Moonlight White, which looks even better in my opinion. Build quality is pretty good. It's mostly made out of plastic, but it's put together really well. I didn't notice any flexes or creaks. The hinge is pretty stable and smooth to open, which by the way, can be done with one hand. They've also managed to maintain a slim form factor uh, because it's only 19.9 millimeters thick and it weighs around 4.4 pounds or roughly two kilos. The included power brick is pretty compact and the cable is easier to manage. This won't take too much room in your bag. The keyboard layout is pretty standard. Asus has separated the WASD keys with translucent keycaps and there are four extra keys at the top that allows the user to quickly adjust volume, mute the microphone and access armory crate, which is where you'll be able to switch between different performance profiles. The keys themselves are really, really good. They're adequately spaced for a comfortable typing experience. I love the feedback that it provides. It's also LED backlit. Interestingly, it doesn't feature RGB. Asus actually took a bold move this time and went with a lighter teal color. And I really like it. It's actually easily one of my favorite keyboards within this price range. Unfortunately, I can't say the same thing for the trackpad. Now, while the surface is pretty smooth, I did notice that it does tend to skip quite a bit. Uh, it's just not as accurate as glass surfaces. Uh, also, the left and right buttons, they just feel dead. I mean, I just wish they were a little bit on the mushier side, uh, but I guess, that shouldn't be surprising because, you know, this laptop is categorized under Asus's mid-range lineup. So for the price point, you know, I just keep your expectations low. Now, normally I would switch over to the webcam test, but unfortunately I can't do that because this laptop, it doesn't have a webcam. Now, I don't know which side of the fence you're on, especially if you're looking for a gaming laptop, but I personally do value webcams because we are living in a day and age where everything is virtual. So webcam is certainly crucial for attending meetings and things like that. So not having it to me personally, it is a deal breaker. Moving on to the speakers, the drivers are actually located at the bottom. It's a classic move by most laptop manufacturers. They sound okay. It's not gonna blow your mind away. Uh, I did spend some time listening to Chilled Cow on YouTube and I noticed that the trebles were pretty clear and the bass was moderate. So 
it's good enough for casual listening. The display, on the other hand, is fantastic. It's 1080p, 240Hz, and IPS, and it's really nice as it covers 99% sRGB, 75% Adobe RGB, and 77% DCI-P3. You see, these are numbers that I'm used to seeing on laptops that cost $2,000, maybe $3,000 last year. You know, it's really refreshing to see good quality displays on laptops that cost less than $1,500, and something that can be pulled as a double duty for uh, content creation or just enjoying watching movies or TV shows. The gaming experience is the icing on the cake. It's fast and smooth, and when you pair that with a three millisecond response time, I think you're you're really in for a treat, especially if you're into FPS titles. Taking a look at the I.O., you've got power in, gigabit ethernet, HDMI 2.0, USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A, a Thunderbolt 4 port, and an audio jack. Switching over to the right, you get a couple more USB ports. Now, the inclusion of that USB-C Thunderbolt port is really interesting because uh, that's typically reserved for premium laptops that cost $2,000, maybe $3,000. Um, so it's really interesting to see that uh, on a laptop that's you know within this price range. So it's a good start to expand your I.O. if that's something that you're looking into. Upgradability is pretty straightforward on the Dash 15. Keep in mind that 8GB is soldered onto the PCB, so you will have one DIMM uh, to populate it with an extra module. In my case, it's fully populated. The primary NVMe SSD is right over here, and the drive speeds are really fast. I got around 3.5GB per second on read and 2.7 on the right side, and there is an additional M.2 slot for expanding your storage, which is nice. So, the tough Dash F15. I've been really conflicted about this laptop because it's built really well for the price. It's portable. Form factor is really appealing to. It gets amazing battery life. The display is fantastic. It's actually really, really nice. The keyboard is great. But um, I just can't... I feel like the RTX 3070 should be paired with the Tiger Lake H35 processor because gaming performance is just left on the table and buyers who are expecting more performance from a higher-end GPU just are not going to be able to get that with this laptop. And that is really, really unfortunate. What's even crazy is that if you take the performance of this processor and compare it to previous generation Ryzen 4008 series, there's just no competition. AMD just kicks the teeth off of Intel and the numbers really do speak for themselves. Now, I do wanna mention that while we haven't tested the sample with the RTX 3060, uh, that might be a pretty good option for buyers uh, for that price range because uh, it does come with a 512 gig SSD and the display does take a little bit of a downgrade but overall, it, seem like, it seems like a pretty good value, provided you're willing to get over the fact that it doesn't come with a webcam. Uh, so on that note, thank you so much for watching. Let us know what you guys think about the uh, Dash 15 from ASUS, and most importantly, the RTX 3070. Are you impressed with this performance? Are you disappointed? Did it meet your expectations? I'm really curious to know. There's so many laptops coming in the way for testing, guys. I honestly can't wait to evaluate individual GP performance and just see how much power laptop manufacturers can just push. But um, yeah, it's going to be a crazy season and I just can't wait. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one.